So last lecture, we talked about the first part of GDP, which was the supply side or like the production side of the economy. But now that we've talked about how things get produced, it's time to start talking about what happens to them once these things are produced. Because if I'm producing items, I'm producing them because I plan on selling them to you. So whatever I make, presumably you buy. Now, of course, you know, it's an assumption of, you know, markets clearing. But in, in the event of that assumption, if I'm producing something, you're buying it. So what is production for me are expenditures for you. Because, you know, you, know, you got to buy the stuff that I'm making. So once we've covered the production side, which we did in the last lecture, it's now time to go to the demand side or how these things are being bought and who's buying them. So we're going to be talking about the market value of final goods and services produced and sold in a country in any year. Because you see, the economy's got lots of goods and services that get produced each year. And each and every one of these goods and services is sold on the market at some price. Now, if we assume that there's no inventory buildup, meaning whatever I make, I sell, there's no, you know, I, I made too much of one thing and then it's, you know, stuck sitting around in a warehouse somewhere. We're not assuming that that's going to happen. So everything gets produced, it gets sold. And when that happens, something really interesting goes on because we can then look at every good and service that was produced in the economy and just add up every one of those guys multiplied by their respective prices, which gives us a measure of GDP from the demand side. So let's look at this table, right? We've got prices and quantities of all these little things made in the country of Chirpistan for the years 2016 and 2017. So we've got cat toys, flea treatment, litter boxes, fancy feast, all this stuff. And we've got certain prices and quantities for the years 2016 and 2017. And we want to know what GDP was in each year. Well, all we would do is we would just take the quantity of, say, cat toys produced, multiply that by the price. So it would literally just be 15 times 12. And that would be the value of cat toys in 2016. What about flea treatment? Well, it would be 50 times 3. Litter boxes, 80 times 6, so on and so forth. We work our way down. So you can see it's fairly easy to do. It can get a little tedious making sure that, you know, you're getting all the numbers lined up properly, but it's, aside from that, just a little bit of multiplication and some addition. So we find the sum of prices and quantities for each good produced in Chirpistan each year. So if I wanted 2016 GDP, you'd see I get 1777 catnips. And then for 2017, I get 2543 catnips. So this is just one of the many ways that we can compute GDP for the economy. But here's another way. It's what's known as the income approach. Because households and firms have income. Firms get their income from their stuff being sold, right? You know, you make a bunch of stuff and then you sell it. Well, the money that comes in is income. Households will get income from providing labor to the firm and generating labor income. Now, there's also non-labor income. What is that? Well, that's like if you own capital and you lend it to the firm, and the firm's going to pay rent on it, and then they're also going to pay interest. Well, that rent and the interest is non-labor income. It's income that you're earning, but it's not being generated from labor. So whether stuff gets sold or not, if you're a worker, you're still compensated. If you work for a company that you know produces stuff, and they make 100 units of the stuff or 110 units of the stuff, you're getting paid regardless, right? So at least from that end, we know that just looking back at the previous slides, GDP in 2016 was 1777. Now, that's equal to income in the economy because whatever gets produced is sold and whatever's sold ends up being income to somebody. So households will earn wages from labor hours. So the first part of the income approach is labor. So if you look at equation one down there, wages, right? Wages from working. The second part here is rent for capital, right? If you lend, we're going to assume that households own the capital stock, and then they'll be renting that capital to the firms. So the firms want to borrow that capital. They're going to have to pay rent on it. 
So we now have wages and we have rent. But if the firm is paying rent on that capital, that's not total um, compensation for what's going on, right? Because even though you're you're being paid rent on whatever you're lending to the, the, the firm, there's still the opportunity cost that you face, right? And what's the opportunity cost again? Well, it's the value of the next best alternative. Now, when they pay rent, when the, the firm pays rent, okay, that's just, a, you know, we want to borrow the stuff for a little while, but there's also going to be interest. Because if the firm borrows this stuff, the household can't do anything productive with it anymore. So the firm's got to compensate you for it. And that compensation is the interest on that capital. So now we have wages plus rent plus interest. And then whatever isn't spent on wages, rent, or interest payments, but still earned in income is profit. So the sum of these factor incomes also totals out to GDP. So let's say that we look at GDP from 2016, right? We know GDP was 1777 catnips. And it needs to be split up between wages, rents, interest, and profits. Plus another little thing I'm adding in here, taxes. I know, don't we love taxes? So we need to make sure that these guys would be equal. So let's say that 600 of those catnips in GDP goes to wages. Well, 600 goes to rent on capital. 300 goes to interest payments on the capital rent. 200 goes to profits. And then that just leaves 77 catnips. Well, that goes to taxes. We add them all up and we see that they equal 1777. So it's another way to compute the same number. So now that we've gotten through the income approach, let's talk about another way to compute GDP. This is really going to be the way that you'll see more often than really any of the others, at least on the demand side. Consider we have GDP that got produced, and that's equal to Y, right? That output creates income. And then we want to know how the income gets spent, because, you know, if you earn stuff, you're going to want to spend it or, you know, possibly save it. So how does that get split up? Well, it gets split up and then spent on a couple of different things. There's consumption, there's investment, government spending, and net exports. So we're going to go through these components just a little bit more. Consumption, which is just denoted C with a little lower, like, underscript or underscore T, right? C sub T. This is the market value of all consumer goods and services purchased by households. So if you get a TV for your home, computer so you can play games, a couch for your, your living room, right? Those are all consumer goods. Let's go on to investment now. Investment. This is the market value of physical capital purchased for businesses. So this means buying something for your company to help it expand, right? Lumber to build a bar in your restaurant, TV to show in the bar, of your restaurant, right? If you own a trucking company and you want to buy trucks, right? That would be an investment. Now, I do want to make it very clear. When you hear like, you know, investing in the stock market and all that stuff, that is not investment, right? Investment is firms purchasing or borrowing capital for the expansion of their business. So if you go out and buy stocks, right, that's not going to count as investment in GDP, just wanted to make sure that caveat was taken care of. So the next thing that we got, government expenditures. This is the market value of all goods and services produced by the government. So whenever the government wants to buy stuff, that counts as government expenditures. Then we got net trade flows or net exports, right? The amount of stuff that we make and then sell overseas is called exports, right? So if we make something in the U.S. and we ship it over to the European Union and they buy it, we have now exported that stuff. Now that adds to GDP because we've produced it in the United States. It was sold outside of the United States, but it was still produced within the United States. 
So that's adding to GDP. Now, there's the stuff that other countries make and sell to us. All right, so if there's something that's produced in the European Union and then we buy it over here, right, we have to import that stuff. Those are called imports. Now, imports subtract from GDP because that other country made it, right? They produced it. So it's going to add to their GDP because it was produced there. Now, if we buy it over here, it's not going to add to our GDP because then we'd be double counting, right? So what gets shipped, what gets moved around, produced in one country, adds to their GDP. What gets bought in another country, it subtracts from their GDP. So exports will add to GDP, imports subtract from GDP, which is why we have our net trade flows, XT, right, which is exports, minus MT, which is imports. So we get exports minus imports are net trade flows. Now, generally, it's uh, typically a simplifying assumption to assume that exports minus imports will be equal to zero, or exports equal imports. Now, in reality, that's not usually the case. Um, but when exports and imports are equal and they zero out, we get what's known as a trade balance. So a couple things I want to cover about government spending. Government spending covers stuff like the military, public projects, Space Force, cool things like that. Now, when you do think of government spending, though, let's talk about what it's not going to cover. It doesn't cover Social Security or social programs or interest payments on the debt. So if you're thinking about GDP and you're like, well, there's all these like transfer payments uh, and like entitlements and stuff, that's not adding up to the, the little G term in GDP. Right, where is it? Uh, well, we'll get to it in a second. I guess I haven't shown it yet. Oops. All right. So that stuff isn't adding up to that G term in GDP. It's only covering goods and services that the government is purchasing that year. So, okay, well, net exports, I guess I sort of already covered this. I got a little ahead of myself here. So the stuff that we make and sell overseas, exports, they add to GDP. Imports take away from GDP. Now, if we were going to be real about this for a second, exports take away from consumption because we're not consuming that stuff here. We'd like to consume it here, but we're not. And other countries consuming it. Now, imports add to our consumption. So really, to make these two guys zero out, we add exports to GDP and subtract imports from GDP, which then balances out the consumption component of GDP. Now, I'm not going to test you guys on that. You don't need to be able to recite that mathematically or anything. It's just a nice little caveat to know here. So when we add these components together, we get what's known as the national accounting identity, which is Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. Now, like I said, we typically assume that exports and imports are equal, therefore they zero out, in which case we just get Y equals C plus I plus G. So if only items that are sold are counted as expenditures, how do we get GDP from that? Because does you know production count items that are both sold and not sold? Well, both items that are sold and not sold do count as expenditures. It's just a question of where the expenditure goes. If the item is sold, right, it's a consumer good. It adds to consumption. If the item isn't sold, who owns it? Well, the firm does. Because, see, the firm didn't make it for free. They incurred some kind of cost to produce it, and they're also going to face some kind of cost to store it. So until they're compensated for that by somebody who wants to buy it from them, their ownership of it means that they bought it. So you make something, you don't sell it, it's treated as if that you bought it. So that would add to investment, not consumption. So how would we compute GDP from the equation that we, the national income accounting identity? How would we do that? Well, we look at how much of the economy was spent on, or the economy's output was spent on consumer goods, how much was spent on investment goods, and then what gets spent by the government. And we assume there are no social programs that operate through transfer payments, and the government's got a balanced budget, meaning what they tax is what they spend. Now, if they don't have social transfer payment programs, right, none of the tax dollars are getting transferred. So it's not like I'm taking 
I'm, I'm doing a Robin Hood where I'm going to you know, steal from the rich and give to the poor or anything like that. That's not happening, right? The only taxes that are getting extracted by the government are going to fund government programs like you know, roads or the military, things like that. Now, we're also going to assume that the government's got a balanced budget. And what that means is that they don't have to borrow any money to fund their expenses. It'd be nice if that was happening in the real world. Now, these are obviously super simplifying assumptions, but it makes things easier for us right now. So that way we can just kind of learn the basics. When we get the basics, we can go a little bit further into it. So this is all going to tell us right away that government spending equals taxes, which is the capital T. So we know that G equals T equals 77 catnips from our computations in the previous slides. Now, if we further assume there's no trade, all right, that would leave the remaining 1,700 catnips to be divvied up between consumption and investment. So without any more information here, we've got no way to figure out what consumption and investment are. But we can sort of figure this out. Rent was 600 catnips. This is what was paid to borrow capital. All right, so right there we know investment is going to be 600 catnips. And when the economy's closed, meaning there's no trade, then savings and investment are equal to each other. So we can look at what the country spends on consumer goods and what they don't spend on consumer goods, but they still keep, which then becomes investment because they're saving stuff, right? And if you're saving, that becomes investment because what you save is equal to what the firm invests. So let's assume that people save a constant fraction of their income, and we're going to call savings as capital S and the savings rate this lowercase s. Now, savings, capital ST, has a little T subscript there because it is time variant, right? The, the saving, the total savings can vary over time. However, the savings rate is a constant fraction of income. So because it's a constant fraction, it's time invariant, so there's no T subscript there. There doesn't need to be one because it's constant. It's not going to change over time. So when they save, that savings goes to investment. And we also know that savings is equal to investment, which is equal to 600 catnips. So that would imply that if savings was 600 catnips, right, then the savings rate would be 600 over 1777, or total output, which gives us 0.337, implying savings is 33.7% of output. And it will always be 33.7% of output, at least consistent with the simplifying assumption from this model. So we know investment is 600 catnips, government spending is 77 catnips, and this allows us to figure out what consumption is. So we can kind of back it out via the magic of algebra, because I get 1777 equals CT plus 600 plus 77. And I can deduce that CT, or consumption, is 1,100 catnips. So all in all, production equals income equals expenditures equals the market value of goods and services produced. So we can compute GDP any of these ways and we can get the same result. Now we previously had the table of the factors of production in Turpistan, which can be computed into output using the following production function, right? We saw this stuff a couple days ago. And then we also have a table of how much has been produced and sold in Turpistan, right? We saw this, well, earlier today. So let's compute GDP for 2016, again, using the market value of everything that was produced. Well, we get 1777. And if, you know, you want to go through this and individually write them all out, feel free to push pause and then just kind of work through it and you'll see you get 1777. So that's doing it looking at the expenditure side or the, the second table, right? Right here. But if we use the first table to compute GDP, right, we're going to get using that formula Y equals A times K to the one half times L to the one half. Hopefully, if everything works out properly, we would get GDP being equal to 1777 via the computation of the production function. Well, if we do that, we don't quite get 1777, right? If we throw in 1700, 
for capital, 1600 for labor, we don't quite get 1777. We get 1702.35. But we've got output 1777 equals A times 1702.35. And that 1702.35 is computed via the capital and labor computations in the production function. So those two numbers aren't equal, right? How do we make them equal? Well, we still have the AT term being multiplied by 1702.35. So all I really need to do is just solve for AT. So I take 1777, divide it by 1702.35, and we see that A is equal to 1.077. Now, when A is equal to 1.077, that tells me there's a little bit of growth. There's a little bit of innovation here. And as we talked about in the last lecture, right, when A is equal to 1, there's no growth or, innov or innovation. When A is greater than 1, there is innovation or there, there is growth. And then if A is less than 1, there's negative growth. Now, if A is less than 1, right, and we get negative growth, this, is, this could be something like, you know, a country got bombed and lost all their stuff. Now... In terms of the measurables, right, if a country gets bombed, well, the capital and labor get destroyed. Stuff and people blow up. So we can measure that decrease, but there's also the unmeasurable impact. Because, okay, we killed a bunch of people, but what if we had killed, say, Albert Einstein, right? And we lose all of his research because, well, the libraries were also destroyed. That country would forget that innovation, because, you know, well, we get the, the, the main gist of some of the stuff that he did, but we don't get all of it. We don't know all of it, right? A lot of that stuff needs to be referenced. But if, say, the library that holds all of his research is destroyed and, you know, Albert Einstein is killed, well, we got a big problem on our hands. And that would be a way that you could see negative growth in an economy, at least when it comes to sort of like the unmeasurable impact or the difference between what gets spent on the goods and services in GDP and the measurable inputs for the production function for GDP. So quick little aside, why is there technically like just no growth and everything's steady when A is equal to one and not zero? Because you, know, you might think, hey, it should kind of be zero, shouldn't it? Like, no growth, because you know, then if it's positive, you get positive growth. If it's negative, you get negative growth. Well, it's it's that way because math. And here's a, a quick little reason. So production is given by this production function. You've seen this a lot already, and you'll see it a lot throughout the rest of the course. Now, it's in, like, this multiplicative, exponentiated form. But if we took the natural log of that function, right, we'd get the log of y equals the log of a plus alpha log k plus 1 minus alpha log l. And in natural logs, we can see why you get no growth when a is equal to 1. Because the natural log of a equals 0, then a can't be 0. a actually has to be 1. The natural log of 1 is 0, whereas the natural log of 0 is undefined. So if this were written out in terms of like an additive approach then yeah, the natural log of A would be zero, but that would mean A can't be zero because that's you know the input of the natural log function, not the, the, the output. So when A is equal to one, then we get no growth. If A is less than one, negative growth, greater than one, positive growth. Now, what's not included in GDP? So you know we've, we've gone through the different ways to compute GDP and different ways to kind of compare these different computational methods. And that's all fine and dandy, but what what about like from from the economic side of things, right? Instead of just the, the, the math, what's not included in there that maybe should be? It'd be nice if it could be, right? Well, the first one's home production. It's kind of hard to measure. What is home production? Well, that's like, you know, stay at home mom or, you know, this, as they're talking now, the, the quote unquote trad wives, right? If you want to stay at home and raise the kids, well, there is a significant economic benefit to doing so because this means the mom or whichever parent is staying home 
is investing time and resources into child rearing, which you know, is unam unambiguously positive impact on society for doing that, right? Because the kid is, you know, will always have a parent around, kind of keep an eye on them, make sure they're not trying to do stupid things like, you know, put their keys in the, the electric socket. Not that I tried to do that as a kid or anything like that. Um, but, you know, aside from that, there's also like kind of the education, there's like the guaranteed social interaction, and there, there are very, very positive benefits to home production, but it can be kind of difficult to measure. And there, there are estimates regarding the impact of it, but, you know, these estimates vary widely, and depending on how you do it, you'll get totally different outcomes of the effect of home production on GDP. So it's just sort of left out. Another thing, black market stuff, right? It's kind of hard to trace. Drugs, guns bought and sold illegally, things like that. And although, you know, if you go out and you know the right people to ask, you can you can probably figure out what some of these guys are making. But um, in terms of like, you know, a government bureau trying to go out and extract information they're not going to go up and be like hey excuse me sir you look like you deal you know crack cocaine do you want to tell us how much in the last quarter you've you've made from crack cocaine that's that's not going to happen and these drug dealers aren't similarly aren't going to go up to these government agencies and just go oh hey by the way i've been selling crack cocaine all year and this is how much i made that's just not going to happen arms dealers same thing right i mean if if you're selling guns illegally, that's 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 pretty bad. You you'll that that's guaranteed significant jail time. They're not going to go and rat themselves out. So we kind of have to sort of try to estimate and figure out what these impacts could be. And uh, in developed nations, it can be about as much as thirteen percent of GDP. And in developing nations, it can be as high as almost forty percent of GDP. So these are like non-trivial impacts on GDP that just unfortunately aren't being measured. What else is it included? Well, depreciation on physical capital isn't included because it's kind of hard to follow. And this can be things like you know, having to get new tires for your trucks. Like if you own a trucking company, you know, tires are going to wear down. you got to replace them. If you own a restaurant, you got to replace the tables, chairs, bar stools, things like that. All right, really anything kind of resulting from wear and tear. But... One of the issues could be, how do you know this is something that's new and not something that's meant to replace the existing capital, right? A restaurant could just be like, hey, we want to get all new tables and chairs, not because they're falling apart, because we just want new, nicer looking tables and chairs. All right, well, that's buying new capital. Could also be we have to buy new tables and chairs because the old ones are falling apart. See the issue here. It's a little, little difficult. There's also the effect of externalities. So they're not really counted, right? There could be the costs faced in abating pollution. There's also positive impacts. Right? There's benefits from things like, you know, vaccinations or education. These things can also be kind of hard to track and tally up appropriately. So they're similarly left out of GDP. Now, another thing that's not included in GDP. What about income inequality, right? The distribution of income. What share of the population has what share of income? Well, GDP, one, isn't designed to tackle that. Uh, so when people do attack GDP for that, it's kind of like, well, you're you're getting fussy about a tool that's not meant to address a certain thing. It's like, I mean, are you going to get mad at a screwdriver because it can't do what a hammer does? Like, no. So, you know, moving back, I guess, in the top 1% making 90% of the income, or is it a little bit more evenly spread than that? Well... This is something that GDP just can't tackle. Because all GDP can cover is how much was produced and sold, not who gets what share of the pie. So major, major misconceptions about in income inequality exist. And unfortunately, it can also be hard to get an honest representation of the issue without any kind of hard political biases being introduced into that. And if we do want to get into that, we would need other tools to be able to talk about it. Now, we're not going to be talking about that in this course. Um, there are other macroeconomic issues that I find much more interesting personally. Um, and there are other issues I think are just more important in general. Uh, 
to learn at least for their principles of macro. And then, you know, once you've learned that stuff, if you want to go on and learn about income inequality, hey, you know, be my guest. It's totally fine. But the scope of this course isn't going to be covering that. So let's wrap up. So we're done with chapter two in the book now, which is awesome. We talked about production at the national level, how it can be measured, multiple ways to measure everything that comes out to the same outcome, at least hopefully. And then, of course, you know what wasn't included in GDP. So, yeah, that's all chapter two. Now, the next lecture, we're going to be talking about inflation, which is the increase in the average price level over time. We're going to talk about some of the causes and effects of it. And then, well, why it sucks. So with all that said, thanks for watching this video. And uh, you will be seeing me and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Peace out.